It's a kayak I fished out of for bass tournaments. It's 13 foot, two inches long. It's 40 inches wide. It has a pedal drive. And then I have an, uh, a lithium ion powered electric motor okay. to extend my range also. Um, now I do use that motor for long runs, but when I'm fishing, I slow down. I use the pedal drive. And the same thing on the saltwater side. If I'm gonna make a long run, and get really back into some back marsh chasing redfish, I'm gonna have that motor with me and then I'm gonna pull it up and then use my paddle and then and stake out pole to push pole around like to sight fish for the redfish too. So there's definitely some some uh, leaps and bounds It's kind of jumped with the progression of allowing motors now and stuff like that. And you got you got some of the OGs that are like strictly paddled, like man, it just ruins it. It's like, hey, if it's a tool and it's allowed and it, it can be to my advantage, I'm gonna I'm Dustin Nichols, and welcome to the Tom Rowland Podcast. What's going on, everybody? We got a great podcast for you today. Dustin Nichols from Paddle and Finn is going to join us. He has his own segment on Paddle and Fin called Chasing the Tide. It's a great uh, podcast on kayak fishing, everything you need to know about kayak fishing, techniques, safety, everything. I enjoyed catching up with Dustin. Man, we talk about kayak fishing and tournaments and the difference between different kinds of tournaments. And Dustin has also recently uh, taken, taken control of his health and... Uh, lost a bunch of weight, done all kinds of cool stuff. I think you might be interested in that as well, but stick around for this awesome episode with Dustin Nichols of Chasing the Tide. Dustin, what's going on, man? How are you? Oh, uh, it's going pretty good. Just uh, hanging tight. You know, this time of year is kind of busy. We got tournaments ramping up and stuff like that. So uh, all the fun, trying yeah. to juggle on the bass side and the, and the saltwater inshore side is definitely fun. <laughs> so you're doing, um, are, are all the tournaments that you do out of kayaks or do you do tournaments out of other boats too? I focus mainly on the kayak scene, but I do have friends with, uh, with boats and I get asked from time to time to jump in with them yeah. um, on some of the inshore stuff, you know, uh, redfish and trout tournaments around, around here in uh, the coastal bend area of Texas. But right. Cool deal. Okay. So let's talk about the kayak, uh, tournament scene. Cause that's kind of interesting. I mean, we have, we have some tournaments in Florida that I know about, but it seems like maybe it's a little more active, uh, over your way. Um, or is that true? I don't know. I, I, I started yes, a some. lot of tournaments, but, uh, not, not kayak tournaments. It's pretty hectic this time of year. Like I said, it, uh, you could probably fish a tournament every weekend. Yeah. <laughs> just about. I know my wife probably looks at my schedule I hand her and she's probably like, Oh my gosh, am I gonna get a a, a vacation out of this one or something? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. But uh yes, we have uh we have quite a few local clubs um, you know, that have bass tournaments and they have like a trail series that where they, you know, have a, a schedule set of, you know, three or four tournaments and you work towards an angler of the year title and then you have a championship. And then also what I'm fishing this week coming up is uh, professional redfish league has a kayak division okay. two man team event. It's the best five redfish over two days. And you, it's a live way in, even on a kayak, you have to keep your redfish alive and bring them into a live way in to be released. Right. Um, the bass tournaments is a little different because you have a uh, certified measuring devices that you use from companies that make them like a bump board, a hog drive catch products. Um, and you measure your fish by inches and you're your five best fish aggregate. Mm -hmm. And you have a unique identifier code you get the night before the tournament. You have to have that on a identifier, a piece of paper, a little card, and you have that written down. So that, so you need number to that tournament. So you, you can only, you know, submit fish that you catch that day. You right. know, if, especially if it's a live event where you're fishing a certain lake or a fish, fishing a certain body of water with river estuaries tied into it. And then there's saltwater events that have that also, you know, we have some month long challenges that you have a month to feel like a five red fish stringer. And it's your best, uh, you know, slot fish, 16 to 27 inches. Uh, it runs on the Gulf region and then up the, uh, the Atlantic seaboard, uh, wherever redfish can be called. That's the kayak saltwater series. I'm actually the communications director for them. Okay. <laughs> so uh, shameless plug right there, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's fun to get these, get these things going and be involved. The, the camaraderie, um, 
in these events is what really drew me into them. Oh. You know, the, the meet, meeting everybody, everybody's super cool. Um, you know, you, you, the payouts can be pretty good. You get hundred, 200 people in the tournament at 75 to $150 a pop. And you're talking, you can walk away with, you know, five to $7,000 in first place, which right is on. pretty good. And then some of the bigger national events that are a little more involved, you know, 250 to $300, you know, entry fees. And you have, uh, you know, you'll have 200 plus anglers fishing some of those at times, you know, uh, kayak bass fishing, uh, Hobie sponsors a trail of bass open series. And then Bassmaster also has a, uh, a trail for uh, kayaks now also. And they're going actually going to have the, the championship in, uh, what is it? Uh, Possum Kingdom Lake here in Texas in uh, June uh, for the Bassmaster Classic for kayak side. Okay. And so <laughs> how, cool. how far would those pet tournaments pay out? You got 300 anglers, 200 anglers, or maybe maybe it's one of the smaller ones with 100. How many places are they paying out? They usually play out, pay out 10%, 10 to 15%. I know Bass um, pays out, I think, at 30 places. They just paid out on, on Eufaula. Yeah. Um, you know, I think... Uh, there's a trail in, at Hartwell that's coming up. Um, I know they're they're going to have a stack field there too. There there's a, there's quite a few, you know, guys that, tr- that actually travel around and do this full time. You know, I, I wish I could do that. I'm still stuck with my big boy job for right now. But you know, when I can get away, I'll travel. I went to the um, Kissimmee Chain of Lakes in January and fished a couple of events there. And uh, you know, I have I have kayak, ha- uh, will travel. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's my motto for wow. sure. So, uh, so the the evolution of the kayak um, tournament scene. How long has I mean? I, I'm a little bit embarrassed because I I, I mean well, we we fished the professional redfish tournaments uh, a long time ago, and certainly fished a lot of tournaments in the Florida Keys and that. But but I'm really kind of taken by surprise a little bit about how many tournaments you're talking about and all these different trails. And I just don't have my finger on the pulse. So how long <laughs> has, uh, has the, this evolution of these tournaments been going on with the, with the kayak fishing? I think like the majority of it started as far as, you know, the catch photo release, the CPR tournaments mm-hmm. where you're actually, you know, taking a picture of the fish on the butt board for measurements. Right. Chad Hoover with kayak bass fishing uh, really got that ball rolling. He was kind of the, the initiator of that kind of deal. Cause some of the lakes, you know, were like off limits kind of where you couldn't keep the fish or retain them or something. So you had to have a way that you couldn't weigh in live fish. You had a way to have to measure them and, and come up with that kind of idea. I know that's been around since I want to say 2000. 12 or 13 mm-hmm. maybe and then some of the other series bass just came on last year hobie's been around with their bass open series for i think three or four years now but the tournament scene itself as far as grassroots stuff been around with local clubs and all that kind of stuff has been been going pretty strong we had a trail here in texas called cats kayak english tournament series and they they were one of the og clubs mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure and been around for a while um, and then there's uh, like the Bayou Coast Kayak Anglers or Bayou Coast Kayak Club in uh, in Baton Rouge area or New, uh, near New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, Louisiana is what I meant to say. I'm getting the cities all jumbled there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they, they're one of the, the biggest and longest running uh, kayak clubs in the country. And uh, they definitely been around for a while doing some really cool events also. Um, and then, you know, in the IFA, we had uh, kayak divisions there. Yeah. Then there's been like uh, Paddlepalooza was Bayou Coast. And then some of the other events in Florida. I know there was a big event in Jacksonville, um, Florida there for a while. And then the DOA had a little paddler series for a little while in Central Florida, yeah. like Mosquito Lagoon area and all that. And, you know, there's just been stuff here and there. I didn't really hit it until about 2000 and six 2016 2017 i had already been kayak fishing a while but like like uh you know i was like oh there's all these tournaments i said oh, this is this can be kind of cool mm-hmm. you know because I, I did a few of some tournaments back in my younger years i grew up in southeast georgia um fishing the autumn hall satilla rivers and some of the you know inshore estuaries there st simon's island and uh you know uh, fishing was in my veins you know my granddad and everybody else uncles they were always asking me to go so it was, it was our, always there. And then being around the water, it was just a given, you know, it's just something to do. 
you know, it's fine. <laughs> right. So how would you compare, like, you know, every time you get into these little nuanced things, like you go to a, I don't know, a, a different little segment of the fishing world, you get a different crowd. Like if you go to a kingfish tournament, that's a different crowd than a bass fishing tournament. You go to a bass fishing tournament, that's a different crowd than maybe a fly fishing tournament. How do you think that the, um, like when you first started doing these kayak tournaments and finding out about them, uh, having done some other, you know, regular tournaments, what, what's the scene like? What, what, what kind of, what kind of a person does it draw in, you know, different than, than maybe a, a regular bass tournament or a regular redfish tournament? I mean, they're, I mean, all walks of life too. I mean, I got friends that are, that are lawyers that fish these, sure. <laughs> you know, I got guys that are, uh, you know, work at, at law enforcement or military. I mean, it's same thing, you know, just anybody that loves the water and loves the outdoors, you know, from, from your lower level of events, like the grassroots stuff. And that's where you kind of feed. That's, that's the whole key to the successful tournaments is having these, these grassroots events at local levels. And then, those guys that are excelling in those have, a, it's like a feeder into the mm -hmm. bigger stuff. And, oh, I want to branch out. I want to go fish something a little bigger and, and challenge myself on new bodies of water. And that's the whole thing behind it was, was it growing like that organically through the local clubs, which is really cool. Yeah. Is that how you started with just a local, local club? Yes. Yes, sir. I sure did. It was a, a San Antonio area, San Antonio kayak fishing um, group had some stuff and I, I fished some, some local stuff uh, through the American Builders uh, Association here locally in uh, where I'm at in Texas near Point uh, Comfort Port O'Connor area. Okay, and That's nice. There. And there were some events there that uh, that I was able to fish. You know, back when I first kind of really got into the swing of things. But you know, the whole thing that kicked it off was when I moved to Texas. You know, it was like what's all these people doing getting out of their boats and walking and waiting yeah, around? No everywhere. kidding. I wondered like, the same really thing. Cool. <laughs> Cause I grew up in Georgia, you know, coastal Georgia, you got seven foot tide swings and you step off into the mud, you're up to your neck. You yeah. know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not way fishing there except on like the marsh flats on, 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 uh, you know, flood tides and stuff like that. You can actually get back in there and do some stuff like that. But that was the whole thing it was like, look at this. This is like opportunity for me to walk in and fish somewhere, you know, say if I, you know, just stumbled upon some, some marsh systems and you can walk in and fish these little flats and stuff. And then I was like, you know what, if I could expand my area without a boat, cause a boat to me, you know, is I've, I've been there kind of with friends and stuff. It, it stands for bust out another thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can. <laughs> it certainly you know, can. <laughs> the upkeep and all that, then the storage and everything else, you know? So, so I wanted something a little more cost friendly. And, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna get a kayak. And it just kind of blossomed from there and took off. Yeah. And so in these tournaments, are you able to get out of your kayak or do you have to stay in the kayak the whole time? Or, or oh, maybe some of the in, some of the rules. inshore tournaments. Yeah. Some of the in, inshore tournaments for redfish and trout flounder, kind of the slam kind of stuff. There are certain tournaments that will allow you to get out and wade as long as your kayak is tethered to you. Right. So you have like a little drag rope attached to your like wading belt or something, right. but like, and, and the bass tournaments, you know, you're pretty much in, in there. Yeah. You're pretty much stuck in there. But, but as a, you know, the, the kayak I fished out of for bass tournaments is 13 foot, two inches long. It's 40 inches wide. It has a pedal drive. And then I have an, a, a lithium ion powered electric motor okay. to extend my range also. Um, now I do use that motor for long runs, but when I'm fishing, I slow down. I use the pedal drive and the same thing on the saltwater side. If I'm make a long run, and get really back into some back marsh chasing redfish, I'm going to have that motor with me, and then I'm going to pull it up and then use my paddle and then and stake out pole to push pole around like, to sight fish for the redfish too. So there's definitely some some uh, leaps and bounds that's kind of jumped with the progression of allowing motors now and stuff like that. And you got you got some of the OGs that are like strictly paddle. They're like, man, it's, it's ruined it. And it's like, hey, if it's a tool and it's allowed and it, it can be to my advantage, I'm going to use it. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Like if if – if a motor is allowed and you say that you don't want to use a motor, I mean, you're going to, you're not going to win. Like you, you, the range, just simply just the range of how far you can go in a day opens up. I mean, maybe occasionally somebody might win without, without a motor, but yeah. I would think that if it's allowed, man, you just change the game like considerably. 
So do they have tournaments that um, like no motors are allowed? It's just straight old school. There's there's a few trails that only allow, you know, human powered right. pedal driven or paddle right. driven. The, the Hobie Bass Open Series is one. They kind of focus on just that for right now. But uh, most of the other trails are all, you know, allowing electric motors now. And a lot of a lot of the saltwater tournaments over here have made made a shift also. Hmm. Um, allowing us to use a motor it has to be electric cool it, it definitely extends the range yes it has to be electric no gas right. no gas power so then i mean at some point you it, it 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 defies logic and and defeats the purpose when you when you put so many batteries in your boat to to extend the range further and further and further now the thing's so heavy that it's not worth that so there's a there's a real fine balance are you and everybody else using those those lithium batteries is that that's what you got right there. That's is that the Torquedo yes, thing? Is that's that the Torquedo uh, battery? I'm I'm on the uh, Torquedo's team. Right. Um, I'm very fortunate to be part of them. This is the little nine and a half ten pound battery that the 915 watt hour that powers uh, the 403. I can get about 30 miles range with this battery. 30 here. miles. Yes, sir. And wow. that's just going, you know, three, three and a half miles an hour. So if is I there, peg it out and run it around, it's, it's a little less, but, uh, you know, it's great range. <laughs> so, I mean, but you could conceivably carry extra batteries, right? Yes, sir. I, I carry two. So you, okay. I carry two. No, you can't. You can't. Yeah, it's much, that's the only thing that limits you on the kayak is your weight. Right. You know, you want to, you want to try to keep it minimal to the gear you take, but you know, I have a rod staging, uh, crate that carries some plano boxes some 3700s i can put four in there if i need to and i'll carry in bass tournaments i'll have as many as 10 rods on my kayak just so i don't have to stop and retie i'll have stuff specifically dedicated for each technique same thing for inshore fishing i'll have like if i'm fishing grass flats i'll have a gold spoon i have a top water i have a wake bait i have a plastic like a weedless plastic presentation and possibly a popping cork with a shrimp imitation, mm -hmm. you know, so I can just boom, boom, switch, switch them out real quick, depending on what the fish are doing, where I've got to sit there, retie and waste time because time management is like a big key. Yeah. Kayak, kayak fishing and, and organization too. So having stuff in place to where, you know, you're going to be able to grab it. It's going to be in that same spot every time when I want to grab my net, when I want to grab my pliers, it's right there where I have them in that little staging area. You know, there's certain, there's so many cool tools that are made now specifically for, for kayaks that, that it, it's really cool how far it's come along. Yeah, it is. I mean, like when you go to iCast or something and you pass pass by some of oh. the kayak things, man, I mean, it's every accessory you've ever seen, ever imagined, like going yeah. on, on the kayaks and paddle boards and paddle board kayak hybrids. I mean, it's really cool where it's going. And I think that it certainly opens up the sport to people that either don't want a boat don't have room to store a boat, can't afford a boat. But man, I tell you what, when you rig out one of these kayaks with electronics, 10 rods, uh, all this <laughs> other stuff, I mean, that starts to add up to a boat, it right? I up. mean, it is yes. a boat. It is a boat. It's just a different style of boat. And and you can spend a lot of money on those things now. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, there is more of a minimalist approach. I'll just do a grab and go trip every now and then after work when I come off night shifts and I'll just have a couple rods with me, a paddle, my life vest, my PFD, and just one little couple bags of plastics and a couple of, you know, jig heads, and a couple top waters. And, right. You know, uh, you, you can't get away from that. It's just too easy to do. And then, then being that close to the action and to the water, um, when you're out there just cruising through the, the back lakes and then over the flats and everything, and you can just drift over fish and they don't even see you. And it's just like, it's really cool, you know, being that close to the action. Yeah. Yeah. So when you get in a regular boat and fish these tournaments with your buddies, what's, what's that like? Like when you get used to having all your stuff perfectly organized, exactly where you want it. And in this, in this rig, and then you get in a regular boat, do you enjoy that or not? I mean, like, is it just weird or what? Do you prefer I, the kayak? I, I prefer the kayak. I mean, I still enjoy, you know, just competition, period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I, I grew up surfing, uh, Eastern Surfing Association, and uh, competing in there. I competed, uh, you know, in the military surfing championships. I, I, I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps. I was yeah, stationed I in uh, Hawaii. So, so I was, uh, you know, I was avid in surfing and skateboarding. I still skateboarding. I still skateboard now. Nice. I, I like to ride the pools and the bowls and everything there, you know, and it just, 
it, it keeps me going. And just same with the kayak, you know, keeps me paddling. But, you know, it just it's just, just a great sport. I just love to compete. <laughs> so yeah. if I could compete in a boat and, and there's a tournament that doesn't conflict with my, my, my kayak tournaments, uh, you know, I'll jump in and, and uh, fish those. Or if the boat tournaments will allow a team of us kayakers to fish against the boaters, mm. we'll gladly do that too. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting that you said that a lot of the redfish tournaments are two-man tournaments and kayaks so you can go separate ways and then each of you is responsible for one fish or how does that work do you have to stay close together you, you still have to be in sight of oh, each other okay and say if my if my partner skunked and i caught the two fish then we can still weigh both of them in you know because in texas we do have a three fish right um that's the difference limit so if if say the, i'm fishing a tournament coming up it's a five fish over two days say if we skunk the first day and then I could only catch three the second day. So he'd have to catch two or I, I, he'd have to catch three and I catch two because, you know, we only have a three, three fish limit. Right. Yeah. And that's so different. That, and that's, that's why, why I would hit us. you know, that's why a lot of people have asked like, why is the redfish thing like a two man team thing? And it's because it, because in most States in Florida and Louisiana, it's a two, two fish limit, or at least it was when we were fishing it. And, um, I mean, a one fit one fish per person limit uh, mm -hmm. within the slot. And so 18 to 27 inches. So in order to make it interesting, you really need more than just one fish. You need like two. And so that's why it was a two man team tournament, but the, it's interesting with a, with a kayak tournament. And I didn't realize that it was a three fish limit in, in Texas, but, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. So how in the world did you get stationed in Hawaii as a Marine? <laughs> that seems like the most awesome possible station i have a friend uh well it's my son's friend and he's in the army and he's stationed in in hawaii and i have another friend that was a that's a retired marine and he was stationed in hawaii for a long time um but man that just seems like how did you do that is that ultra luck or did you very very um uh targeted what did you do to get that station it was it started in uh in our mos school um, that's our training for what we're going to do in the service. I went to a, a communications electronic school in 29 Palms, California. I was there for 15 months. It was one of the longer schools to go through. Um, I'd be repairing, you know, the communications gear, the old, this was back in the, uh, in the, in the early nineties. I think it was 1989 when I, in 1990, when I actually left 29 Palms, but we put in our, our top three picks for a duty station. So I wanted to be near the coast because you know, being a surfer, I was like, okay. Yeah. I said, oh, there's a base on Connie, uh, Oahu. I'm putting in for that. And then I put in for Camp Pendleton and then put in for, uh, uh, you know, North Carolina Camp Lejeune, which access to the Outer Banks and everything. So, you know, I did pretty well in school. I was up there in the, in the class and everything. And so I, you know, they were calling everybody's names out at our graduation when we're leaving. And they kept saying, you know, Okinawa, Okinawa, Camp Lejeune, Camp Lejeune, Camp Lejeune. And all of a sudden they said, you know, my name, Dustin Nichols, uh, Kaneohe Mariko Air Station, Kaneohe Oahu, Hawaii. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if it was the luck of the draw or doing well in the, in the uh, school yeah. senior. Or, you know, it's just one of those deals that just, just panned out. <laughs> Man, that is awesome. You know, I'm getting ready to take my daughter there for her senior trip, and we're going to – um, we're, we're going to Hawaii and we're going to fly into Honolulu and out of Honolulu and we're going over to Kona and, and Hilo. But other oh, than yeah. that, we don't have any plans really. Um, so man, I'm open for, for cool things to do, uh, in Hawaii, but I've been to Hawaii twice, both times on the way to Christmas Island and man, oh. I just, I mean, I stop in there, you look around. And the second time I went, I went with my boys and we did some hiking. We got, went up on diamond head. We, um, did some surfing on the North North shore and it was just awesome. And I thought, man, this, I got to come back to Hawaii. This is, it's gotta be one of the coolest places on earth. I mean, it's got for, for somebody that likes to be outside, it is, yeah. it is such an incredible place. You can hike to these waterfalls. You can climb mountains. Mm -hmm. You can, you can be on top of these volcanoes. You can go and be 
in this huge drop off. I mean, talk about kayak fishing wonderland. I mean, you could be offshore <laughs> yes. in a few paddle strokes and and be be fishing for like real fish, like like marlin yes. and like serious stuff. But I mean, that is that is it's just an amazing place. Like, what do you? Are there any absolutes I should do while I'm there? If I get to, if I get around where you were, on on the Big Island, um, you know they have the bike tours. Mm-hmm. Uh, they come down off of uh, Mauna Kea, the yes. mountains up there. We we had a, a army training facility. We went up there, uh, Pohakaloa, that we did some some exercises there. But we helped out during the Iron Man, and it was pretty cool going down there around Hilo and all that. Like you said, yeah. you're gonna be there or Kailua Kai Kona on that side of the island also. Um, there's a fun little surf break there called Banyans. It's pretty good, pr- pretty good little wave, uh, depending on what time of year. Um, but yeah, That's there's always I need the, a the, little the, wave. I need a little, little wave. wave. Uh, yeah. The, the, the local stuff is, is the cool stuff. If you can find a little local poke shops and, and the little, you know, off the wall, you know, food trucks and stuff like that. Yeah. That's the stuff I like to see. Cause I, I, I love food. But, yeah. yeah. Well, my daughter does too. <laughs> um, I asked her what she wanted to do. She said, I just want to eat Asahi bowls and, and, and surf. And I said, sounds good to me. Like, that sounds like a perfect vacation for me. Let's do it. And then we're going to do some hiking and stuff. There's some fun little waves, fun little waves on the South shore. Um, you know, in the summertime, you get a little more South Southern energy during the summer. And so you can fish around like, uh, surf around like the diamond head point has a break called suicides. And then there's graveyards. And then like around where town is at Waikiki area, you know, there's, canoes and queens and then there's number threes and pops and, and kind of Kai, kaisers and then uh alamoana bowls and some mm-hmm. stuff in between there um like to to hang out and just ride a longboard though that that canoes place is kind of kind of you know the thing to do you know yeah. well that's Pretty over that's over uh like around honolulu right or waikiki yes sir yeah, yeah. waikiki area yeah, we're gonna we're gonna move around um because i have been there before but i've never seen the big island and um we also want to go and do that, do the hiking on, uh, on Kauai. And, uh, there's yes. some really amazing, amazing looking hiking over there. The, the, the Nepali coast hike, which yes, is like sir. 22 miles long. That seems, that seems incredible, man. I mean, just the pictures I see of that, that just, it just, that's right up our alley. That's what she wants to do. That's what we want to do. Um, so we're going to give it a shot. I don't know. It sounds fun. Sounds like a great trip. You know, Kauai, uh, I think, is that the one they call the Garden Isle? I can't remember. I think so. The Garden Island, yeah, I believe so. I think it, they don't they don't call it that for a reason, you know. Right. So I, I, I haven't been to Kauai, but I've just heard it's absolutely beautiful over there. Yeah, me um, too, man. You know, I'm really that's one of the places to I did get to make it to. Yeah, yeah. It should be a fun trip. I know she'll she'll enjoy that yeah. <laughs> for sure. Do you think if you, uh, if you were stationed there now, knowing what you know about kayak fishing, that you would, uh, oh. you would go for the uh, – the biggest fish you could possibly catch. I mean, there, there are, you know, videos of guys catching Marlin and stuff on kayaks. It's amazing. Yes. Yes. I, if I knew what I know now and what's over there, you know, it, it would happen because we, we do it here. I mean, we got to have the right conditions and stuff like that, but we beach launch and fish like the, the short rigs near shore, um, current seam rips and uh, grass lines and stuff like that. Also, we, we do a lot of king fishing. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we get some ling, cobia, uh-huh. and some snapper on some near shore uh, rocks and stuff like that. And I, I do have a friend that caught a sailfish at, off of Corpus Christi. Uh, he caught a, you know, it was 89 inches, I believe. Wow. So pretty so decent, how, pretty how decent far sailfish. out do you have to go to, to, to get to, you know, 100 feet of water into on the Texas coast? Oh, now that's a good. <laughs> that's a good way yeah so but but he catches uh, he caught a sailfish 10, 10 miles nine okay. or 10 miles 10 miles sure. and then but your buddy caught a sailfish closer in than that i believe he was only about four and a half or five miles offshore so what, he was i think 30, he was in 60, feet of water, 60, 60 65 or so yeah. i think in the keys we have a lot of different situations where the sailfish will will push into 20 feet of water 30 feet of water and they'll be chasing the ballyhoo but I mean, oh, wow. our reef is just right there. I mean, you're in 20 feet yeah. of water, but the reef is really just right there. So, I mean, it sounds like you're fishing them up on the beach, but you're really not. I mean, you're still you're still like three or four or five miles out, but the water's shallow. And it's one of the coolest things ever because 
you can run along and all of a sudden there's this giant black fish over white sand and uh and you can you can throw it to him in 20 feet of water and it's pretty pretty cool when that's happening but um it would be it would be hard in in a kayak i think but but maybe not i don't know i mean i think that with the kayak fishing you know you 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 certainly have to kind of pick your spot way more so than than yeah. than a boat like you're going to um say okay well this is where we're fishing because it's going to take me all day to get there i mean you're just moving so much slower than a boat even if you have the torpedo motor and and you're you're pushing along i mean a boat can say let's go check that out i don't like it let's move and and they you know run run 20 miles that's yeah. like that's got to be one of the things about the kayak fishing that you got to got to kind of make a plan and and for the most part i would imagine that you're sticking to it rather than than making some giant deviation you're going to make do with what you've kind of in this little area that you've you've picked right yes yeah some like on freshwater events and well saltwater events too if there's open boundaries uh some events are are you know shotgun launch you all launch from the same place but a lot of them are called a road runner that's where there's launches if it's public access you can launch anywhere so i mean there's been days i've had two hours left and threw a hail mary and, and went relocated and, and filled my limb and, and finished well you know there's so stuff you like mean that. you can you can and, take the kayak out of the water trailer it or put it on your truck and go somewhere yes. else and then put in again okay yeah yes sir and that then that's just you know limits your time you got time constraints and stuff you got certain time you you have to have your fish uploaded or, or certain time you got to be at weigh in you got certain times to check in and stuff like that so then you start dealing with time management which is which is a big factor not having those uh 300 horses behind you pushing you along at 75 right. miles an hour. Well, I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's, it's the same factor in, 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 in that type of fishing. It, it's all about the, the time management. And when we, we, when we were fish in Texas, for example, um, we knew the water of Louisiana. So if we're fishing like, you know, uh, Northern Texas, Sabine area or something like that, um, you know, like, are we going to look for fish over here? Or are we going to run, you know, all the way back to Louisiana to where we know their fish. Maybe we can only fish for 30 minutes, but we feel like in 30 minutes, we're going to have a better shot of catching two big fish there than six hours over here because we've never been here before. Right. So right. there's, there's this, you know, this whole, I mean, kind of, kind of gets me kind of excited to think about it because it was some of the most exciting fishing times that I think I've ever had of like, do we have enough fuel? If we don't have enough fuel, where are we going to refuel and how long is that going to take? Yeah. And is that even legal? Because in some tournaments, you're not allowed to do that. And so yeah. if it is legal, like, should we go spec, spec that out first and make sure there's going to be somebody at the gas dock? Or are we going to be, because if yeah. there's not anybody at the gas dock, I mean, we just shot ourselves in the foot, right? So maybe go over there and leave them a 20 and be like, hey, look, about two o'clock tomorrow, we're going to be coming by here. How about you? be right here ready for us you know i mean but it's all time management just like you're talking about yes, it's sir. just it's just a different thing like you still got to make it back in time and you're still trying to ring every second of the day out you know but it's just different it's just different how much uh does yeah. physical physical uh ability play into the top five or six guys on these kayak tournaments like are the if you're in really good shape, is that paying off? Well, I mean, it does to a certain extent. Um, you know, kind of goes hand in hand, especially if you're, you know, paddling and pedaling, you gotta go long distances and that. It's definitely gonna be to your advantage to be in better shape. It, it definitely will. And I, I've just recently kicked off um, you know, doing intermittent fasting. Mm, um, yeah. I kind of let my let my, you know. Uh, it let it take over and, you know, kind of got a little out of shape. I work inside. I run a big, you know, got like 10 computer screens. I run a chemical process through like reactors and compressors and all that stuff. So I'm sitting down for a 12 hour shift. And, you know, I had to make myself, you know, get up and eat better. Cause you know, it's like working split shifts, you know, in the middle of the night, I'll get hungry. I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna have that bowl of fruity pebbles. <laughs> and, and that's not the best thing to do, you know, and being that I'm old stub and jarhead, you know, I got the, the, the mind over matter part where I can tell myself, look, dude, you need to get checked yourself and get in shape. And, and 
I've been on a pretty good journey so far. We got a guy that started a, a kind of workout program uh, called this kayak, the kayak beast program. Nice. <laughs> and uh, he's an avid kayak fisherman. He's a, he's a uh, kinesiology major. Uh, he was a coast guard, retired coast guard, a uh, retired coastie and he kayak fishes. And we kind of met through this whole group of people. And that's the cool thing about the networking in the kayak community yeah. too. Um, and we, I'm in the beta program. He started out, I, I'm limiting my caloric intake. Um, I know you talk a lot about fitness, so I was pretty yeah, stoked on yeah. that when I saw some stuff about CrossFit and all that. So we're doing some high impact, uh, metabolic exercises and, you know, doing an intermittent fasting. I'm doing a 16 with an eight hour eating window. I've cut my carbs. I've cut my sugars. I quit drinking sodas. Um, I think this morning I'm down almost 17 pounds in Dang. about three weeks, three weeks. Like, yes, sir. That's awesome. It's insane. That I did is like really a little awesome. I did like a fiber cleanse through Advocare for the first 10 days. Uh -huh. And then, um, then I just been, you know, high protein limiting carbs. I'm do only doing like, um, natural sugars, like through fruits and vegetables and different things like that. Like substituting my bread. I use a red bell pepper and put a little cream cheese with everything. Bagel seasoning with like meat and cheese, yeah. make a sandwich like that. Uh, brown rice, uh, quinoa, couscous and stuff like that instead of the white rice and nice. and, and, and so when you know, you're when you're going potato. to your 12 hour <laughs> shift are you are you packing food with you now like yes, so sir. that you have what you need and you're eating in the in the time that you're supposed to in the window yes sir i do that and on the kayak too especially when you're on the water for eight plus hours during these tournaments you know i gotta have something uh you know to keep my energy keep me sure. going yeah, so yeah. you know it's uh jerky and then uh quest makes a decent protein cookie i've been i'm not i mean i'm not affiliated with them or anything but that's the one, the peanut butter one is probably by far my probably my most favorite one i've found to and it's something that you know gives me a little fuel on the water um you know fruits i'll pack a little small ice you know collapsible ice chest and pack some fruit and some, some veggies and stuff in there too lately nice. so that's definitely been helping out just mainly staying hydrated and flushing your body and keeping that water in you and all that so yeah so yeah I was, I was up to the, the biggest i've ever i mean i i still felt like i carried my weight well because i've always been kind of stocky guy anyways but you know, when I stepped on that kit scale and saw that number, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> how, how did I get there? <laughs> That's what it takes, man, is is at some point you just got to be like, okay, not, not another pound is going on that scale. Like, I'm going to do anything and everything necessary to be going the other way, right? Like, but it sounds like you ran into, a, you know, great resource. And, and you, so yeah. you got like a group going? Like there's a group of you? Yeah, there's a group. I think there's 14 or 15 of us in this in this beta beta program. He's got a little app he started. Um and their first group, I think there's a couple guys that have lost over 20 pounds already. Nice. And everybody seems to be doing well because there's people that just adjusted their eating times that didn't change their habits and they're still dropping a couple of pounds a week, which is pretty cool because it's just by just an adjustment. And it worked out. And then they're still doing some of the exercises and stuff like that. Um, I started a couch to 5K kind of deal with my nice. wife and been running running more than I have in a long time. So I've been making myself run three times a week. You know, it's just intervals like you walk for a minute and a half, sure. run for three minutes, walk for just to get it built back up in my I got I feel like I have a lot of stamina just because I paddle. Right. Sometimes well, I'll should. paddle six, yeah. seven miles, you know. And, and then the surfing. And then too. I can like, Yeah. Oh, I haven't sir. Uh, I haven't surfed in about a year and a half. I, I kind of got burned out and took a break. Okay. <laughs> the fishing took over like big time. Is yeah. What it did. Yeah. Uh, and then Texas, the waves, you know, we deal with a lot of junky wind swell a lot. So it kind of, kind of got just burned out on it. I, I, I still will travel, um, you know, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, you know, been, been around there, in Central America, some good stuff. Uh, Baja, California, you know, all down that way, Baja, Mexico, all that good stuff. But you know, the, Fitness and kayaking does it, it does go hand in hand when you look at it. You well, know, it so, seems so like it seems it like it would. It I mean, it seems like it would. Like, like if you're if you're out there and I don't know, maybe you don't have as much. Maybe you maybe you don't have a motor at all, or you don't have as much juice as you want. And you know, man, I really need to be on the other side of this bay right here. But it's into the wind. Do I really want to do mm -hmm. that? Like. Yeah, if you're in great shape, you're like, hell yeah, let's do it. If you're not, you're let's like, go. Uh, go. I'm just going to see if I can fit, 
Catch another one right here. And maybe maybe you do better right there, right where you are. I don't know. Maybe it's not, not necessary, but it sure does seem like that is a very physical, you know, and it physically demanding thing that the better shape you're in, the better it would pay off. That's what I would think. But like I'm not a kayak tournament fisherman, but I mean for I'm sure certainly... I can tell a difference just recently with uh having to uh like reach down and grab stuff and having to reach around into my crate and grab gear. I can just tell maneuverability wise that it's gotten a lot better. <laughs> also, wow, I don't a little have bit that of pillow that, right that, there. <laughs> a little bit of pillow right there, kind of. <laughs> That's cool, man. So, do you for guys sure, get together sure. and, and exercise together, or is it mostly the we group? We do. We is, go through a Zoom. For eating. It's a Zoom. We get on Zoom, and then we did. We had a workout last night. We had a a, a little three circuit with uh, five exercises we did last night in about twenty five minutes just to get the your Man, that's metabolism awesome. gets your heart rate up. That's awesome. And, and we do it on Zoom. We kind of interact. And then I got on and shared, you know, the group. It's a, you know, we got a Facebook group. So we we get on there and share recipes and stuff like that. I worked as a chef for many years. I didn't throw that in when I had sent an email. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I love food. I love to cook. And and, and uh so I, I I threw together some recipes and stuff and and been I went live with them and kind of shared them a quick stir fry, you know, something a little healthier nice yeah, so it's, it's so you probably cool you probably system. kind of piqued the interest of most of the the people in the audience because we do have a lot of people that, that listen to this that are that really want to to get in better shape and a lot of people find themselves just like you did like what the hell happened i was a marine like i was in phenomenal shape and then what is this yeah. like what is going on <laughs> i don't i don't even know what happened and and they want to get back in in shape, and they don't really know how. Like, what's this thing called? Is it something that other people can join, or or is it still in the beta? Yeah, he, um, there's the beta group that he's working on right now, the beta process. But um, what is his kayak fitness? I'm sorry, I took. Yeah, that's all right. There's a Facebook group called uh, Kayak Fishing Strength and Fitness, and it's a group you can go on there and look it up on Facebook. Um, and check it out. And uh, it's a private group, but you'll, you know, you can be added. I think you got to answer a few questions to get in there. Yeah. But uh, the guy's name is Luke Prentice. Um, you know, he posts, he's posting updates of how we're all doing and all everything like that on this page here. And then we're all just kind of sharing info and stuff on there. So it's pretty cool. I, I was pretty, I'm pretty impressed with the outcome so far. And it's an eight week program. So I'm in week two. Oh, well, so, dang, man, you're having some un unbelievable progress in, in two weeks, but I don't know what, what that sounds like to me is it sounds like that is incredibly sustainable because you have created this, this group of people around you that have similar in, in interests. Like you guys are all kayak fishermen, right? So like yeah. you're, it's all like, it's not like you're just hanging out with a bunch of people you don't know or like, like that seems like, like when people ask me, like, what do I need to do to get rid of this? Like, I got to get back in shape. I'm always the first thing I always say is like, well, what do you like to do? Like, what's fun? Like, mm -hmm. do you like to play tennis? Like whatever, whatever it is. Like, if that's what you like to do, then why don't you do something that you like to do to get back in shape instead of like something that you hate? Like if you don't like it and you don't like the people that you're around and you don't like the commute over to the gym you're probably not going to stick with it very long. Like what about finding something that you like? Like this sounds perfect, man. You got like, you got like the right people around you. You got somebody that knows what they're doing. You're having great results. That sounds like something that, you know, is easy to stick with. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, for sure. And then he, he started out pretty much the same way. He's like, man, what, I how'd I let myself go like this? You know, he did. And the then he's like, man, major. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's like, man, I got a, I got a little out of shape, you know? And he's like, you know, I gonna do something. And he started doing this intermittent fasting and this training, uh, you know, higher impact metabolic, you know, circuits and stuff right. like that. And then he's like ripped. He's Jack. He's like, got <laughs> six packs. I'm like, man, if I could just get a four pack, I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Of course. So what about the time that you're eating? Like, like for, for people that don't know what he's talking about, like, it's intermittent fasting. So you'll have a period of the day that you're not eating this period of like you're saying 16 hours and then a period of eight hours of the day that you're allowed to, to eat. So what, what, how did you choose what time of the day that you were going to eat? Oh, I just, 
I was just like, you know, it's 16 and eight. So I wanted to kind of have a window to where after I woke up and got, you know, I'm not a big, big, huge breakfast person, person, but I, you know, I'd like to eat some oatmeal with fruit in it and stuff like that. But I was like, you know, I could kind of skip a meal and the, you know, kind of miss more of the morning, you know, eating time. So I went from 10 45 to, you know, uh, eight to six, four, I was about to say 18, 45, six, <laughs> six 45 in the evening. I was about to give y'all military time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, it, it just seemed like that was a little better fit because I do start off with a little small, uh, my bigger meal is, is earlier in the day. And I finish with a lighter meal in the evening. Um, every now and then I will throw a, you know, a, a meal replacement shake in there in the middle. It depends on what's going on, or I'm, maybe I'll eat that, use that as my first meal of the day if I'm fishing, if I'm on the water or something. Um, but you know, it, it it was a little adjustment getting used to it. But you know, it's not that bad. I, I'm I got a tracker, I got an app, fitness track, uh, fasting tracking app. I'm mm-hmm. keeping up, and I'm keeping up uh, my caloric intake through another uh, my fitness pal or something. One yeah. of those apps that track, and it 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 syncs with the app that he has. So we can log all our stuff and then log our exercises, log our, our fasting times and everything like that. So it's actually a pretty cool little deal. Yeah. It sounds great, man. Well, good job. That's that's awesome, man. That's some great Thank you. Yeah, results a, for, for a couple of weeks in. That's amazing. I'm hoping to keep it rolling. Oh, I'm sure you will, man. <laughs> you got all the right you got all the right the recipes to keep it rolling. Like the only thing that would be like not so good is if your wife was like not not down with it. <laughs> You know, like, actually, she's doing a little bit of intermittent fasting, too. And she go. is um, she she's been working at, at getting building herself to run a run and be better conditioned. She has fibromyalgia, so she just gets these real pains and and stuff all the time. And it's actually helping with her, oh, you great. know, some of that. You know, she's not really having as, as, as much of that now. So it's actually pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, now that you're you're going to be ripped, lean and mean and, and back to your your. <laughs> uh marine fighting weight um i hope so. <laughs> so what what do you got going on for the rest of the year you said you were got a tournament tomorrow and you've been pre-fishing for that yes sir i pre-fished for that we had a lot of uh about a week and a half we had a major rain event here about you know seven to nine inches in spots so a lot of my backwater uh areas with some you know back lakes and marshy areas really got flushed really bad with a lot of fresh water um, that have drainage uh, systems like creeks and some smaller rivers that flow into these back bays. And some of those just got ruined. So I had to like readjust and I went down and fished some uh, grass flats in the uh, low in Laguna Madre around Corpus Christi and kind of stumbled on some fish yesterday. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. We're going in full, full stream, uh, putting all eggs in one basket basket right there and fishing some of the flats, just make long drifts. Um, you know, just burning a spoon basically is all mm-hmm. we're going to be doing, burning spoons over these sand pockets and stuff. Cause there's a lot of floating grass in there at times. So really top water is out of the question. Um, so I'll have a spoon, a, a small spinner bait with a plastic and then probably a pop of cork with a shrimp imitation just to, mm-hmm. you know, was- burn it up, just cover a lot of water. And, and that's about it. Cause the, with the way the wind's going to be, the sight cast is going to be out of the question. Uh, you're just going to have to cover water and just fan cast and just blind cast up pool out of it <laughs> yeah well that's that was one of our uh, uh ways that we ended up catching some fish in texas on the on the redfish tournaments when we went there we went to a port aransas tournament and that's where we yes, did sir. just like what you're talking about got over the grass flats and just drifted no trolling motor mm-hmm. nothing just drifting mm-hmm. along and just making as many casts as you possibly could and uh that's how we caught most of our fish that that we weighed you know I mean, like we tried the sight fish, sight fishing and everything, and there's some beautiful water down there, man. That looked oh, yeah, as gorgeous, much like uh, that looked as much like flamingo kind of like where we where we fish as as anything. I mean, the tournament that we did before that was in Kima, Texas, and man, yes, sir. talk about not knowing what to do. That water was so. <laughs> <laughs> we came from the beautiful, clear Florida Keys water, and we go and we show up there, and I was just like, what? are we going to do? I have no idea how to fish here. I mean, the water, literally you couldn't see a, a, a millimeter into the water. It was so dirty, but, but those guys knew how to catch fish. I mean, they knew how to catch fish in mm-hmm. that water. I just, 
I was just blown away that you could catch anything in the catfish, anything in that water. And, uh, <laughs> but they did, man, they knew how to do it. And then some people figured out how to run to Sabine and there was clear water over there and there was beautiful water over there. That was, that was real nice. Um, but then yeah, when we got down to Port Aransas, I mean, I was like, okay, now this, now we're talking, this is, now this we're talking. is nice now we're here. Talking. I mean, that is, that's a nice area. Um, all that down there. It, it is really cool. I, I, I do like fishing the flats, but you know, I have a, a place close to my heart in this back, back marsh, backwaters over here. And, and I do a lot. It's a lot of visual, though, with the, uh, you know, surface activity, you know, fleeing bait fish and shrimp and or birds. You know, the birds are a big key for the redfish, you know, especially those white, you know, uh, herons or little mm -hmm. cranes or whatever. Yeah. There's not really social birds. So if they're all piled up and playing hopscotch over each other, they're chasing shrimp they're getting pushed by redfish and you need to be line over there <laughs> yeah so that plays a lot of factor into that too in this water over here in the back marshes that might not be as clear but yeah I, i'm looking forward to that tournament I, I got some bass stuff coming up i think we have a uh my southeast texas trail has an event on sam rayburn and then the weekend after the hobie bass open is on sam rayburn in, in texas here uh, i'm not sure if i'm gonna make that one and then uh i know we're supposed to have a live event on the gulf coast region through uh, kayak saltwater series, but that's to be determined. And then just wrap up the year with the professional redfish league, the saltwater tournaments. I have two more. I got to stop in Matagorda and stop in um, Corpus Christi. And then the redfish world series for the kayaks will be in October. And then a redfish national championship for the kayak saltwater series will be in Gulf shores in November. So, you know, there's a few more tournaments here and there. I got a trout event at the end of this month too. saltwater survival series. Yeah. I need to look at my schedule. <laughs> That's pretty, a lot. It's pretty man. busy. It's yeah, pretty busy. And then, and then I cast, if I can get away to Orlando, I have a option to go there with a few different companies. So I, I'll sure. possibly be at ICAST. I'm looking forward to it to kicking back off this year. As last year we, we missed out. And, I know. And, and no, if you had never been to that. If anybody is listening to this, man, it's like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is well if you get there man let's hook up and uh and meet in person for sure that'll be yes, great sir, we'll, for we'll sure. definitely, definitely be there and um there'll be uh there'll be all sorts of stuff going on there um so you must have like you got my interest peaked because you must have a pretty interesting job you said you got these 12 hour shifts you're doing all this stuff but then it also gives you enough freedom and time to go and fish all of these all of these different tournaments. So what is it that you do for a living? I'm a, a petro, I work at a petrochemical plant. I'm a process operations. Um, I, I run the equipment. Even if the, if I'm working in the field, I'm out there making adjustments on valves, taking readings, pulling samples, stuff like that. I mainly work inside now. I, I run the whole process through the computer system, um, you know, monitoring levels, pressures, uh, temperatures, different things like that, flow rates and stuff like that and, and running yeah. the equipment. So That's I work a split shift. Um, it's days and nights. I work 14 days out of 28, but it's all split. You know, I get a seven day off break every four weeks. So I do work two weekends uh -huh. out of the month and I'm off two weekends out of the month. So I got to pick and choose my vacation days to kind of cover stuff. But a lot of the times I'm, I'm off and don't need to take any days off at all. Wow. So it, it does work out pretty cool. And then my wife's a teacher. So I get to fish a lot during the week. Um, you know, my wife's a teacher, my, my daughter's in school. So during the week, if you know, there's less pressure on the water anyways, most of the time, you know, <laughs> right. So it, it's good to be able to get away during the week or, or if I can get out a few hours after a graveyard shift, you know, I, I'll, I'll fish for a few hours and sacrifice sleep just to go get on some fish. You know? Right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So did you notice a did you notice a surge in in uh, in anglers and angling pressure, especially with the kayak um, uh, world uh, post COVID or during COVID? Yes, sir. Tremendously. Really, tremendously. A lot of new people entered. A lot of new people entered the sport. Just the growth alone is insane. I mean, in the industry right now, um, you're having logistics problems with the manufacturing companies, like with the backups at the ports, with the containers mm -hmm. stuff, they can't get the pieces and parts. Like say you can't get a seat frame in, they've been waiting on them. Say you can't get these straps in, say you can't get these tracks in that you're going to use to mount accessories. It's across the board. Um, I'm associated with Jackson kayak. I'm on their factory team and I'll, I'm also their the team manager for the South region of the country. And from that standpoint, we're seeing, you know, 
dealers are affected by orders getting reduced. And it's not just certain companies, it's across the board. It's just the demand is so high right now for people wanting to get outside. Mm-hmm. And it through last started last year. Like when all this first hit, we were it was just like, man, uh, what's gonna happen? Are we, you know, right. how's everything gonna turn out? And the industry just went through the roof. I mean, everybody had banner years last year, you know. Crazy. Yeah, it is. So tell me about your podcast. It, would do you kind oh, of yeah. um do you is part of it kind of education based like for all these new anglers? Are you are you taking it upon yourself to 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 be a, a source of of information and and ethics and kind of behavior of of new anglers like when you have this big surge of people that come in i just this has been something that's been kind of on my mind and i've been talking about it here on my podcast and stuff but like you know a lot of people don't don't have any idea what to do what's right what's wrong what's good behavior what's bad behavior just wondering kind of if you guys are are taking it upon yourself to to talk about those things Oh, yes, sir, for sure. And try to be a good steward of the sport, you know, especially representing some of the companies and stuff you do. You have to, you know, in, in benefiting those companies from you promoting them, you have to, you know, like I said, be a good steward. Um, so it is, we, we, you know, we like to focus on tips and tactics, you know, safety standpoints, you know, not not everywhere is required to wear a PFD, but it, it's going to be on me at all time, no matter if the water's three feet or or or, or seven foot or 10 foot, you know. In the Marine Corps, I did actually do some, a lateral move, you know, at the end of my uh, stretch there. And I did water survival instruction Mm. and did swim qualifications and everything. So I've always been around the water, you know, with the surfing and everything. And it is just a second home to me. I love the water. And being that, I still will have my PFD on. I don't know what's going to happen on the water. Something could fall out of the sky and hit me in the head and knock me out, you know. And that's just the what is, you know, whatever. But. The main thing is just, you know, promoting that safety on the water. Um, you know, float plans come into play on bigger trips or offshore trips, you know, it just tips and tactics or organization. We do, we have some stuff on there. I like to get into that with my guests, you know, different regions, different fisheries in different regions and talk about what's worked there and how it would work elsewhere where they could branch out. And then, you know, I'll, you know, put out little surveys for, for uh, listener questions and things like that to kind of see what they want to hear. You know, we'll have a, just a, segment on you know trophy trout or we'll have a segment on you know tournament prep or things like that you know so it's, it's actually pretty cool you know um i'm part of the paddle and fin network mm-hmm. so you say i think we have eight episodes and uh, we just did join the waypoint tv family yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's how we connected so i appreciate you reaching out with that also oh yeah for but, sure. yeah my, my segment's called um chasing the tide it's it just kind of fitting because i do cover the more of the saltwater side of the kayak angling and, uh, you know, it's been a great ride so far. I've been doing this. Uh, I think this is my almost a year and a half. I've been doing the podcast okay. now with uh, uh, under chasing the ties name. And, you know, like my wife says, she's like, you know, you could, you could talk the paint off of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be a good podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sometimes my, I mean, I get a little excited. I talk fast, you know, my Georgia and Texas, mailed of uh accent with the little hawaiian slang yeah. thrown in <laughs> my, 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 my trips the people out it's like oh, okay <laughs> yeah well it's good man you got a lot of you got a lot of uh enthusiasm and and obviously a lot of good information too so the paddle and fin the way that that works like somebody would subscribe to paddle and fin and then your show your segment is going to come out on a certain day or can they subscribe yes, to your show uh, only. No, you subscribe for the <coughs> paddle and fin, just paddle and the letter N and then fin. And then, um, our shows rotate. Mine is bi-weekly on a Sunday. I'm, mine comes out every two weeks. Okay. Um, you know, and then we have, we have some segments on the outdoors. We have segments, uh, about destinations. We have a hunting segment. We have a bass fishing for news. We have some gear review, uh, tournament update podcast and then like the og show was the original show that started out um you know and it, it, it's pretty cool we got a quite the uh plethora of, <laughs> of information yeah yeah well, it sounds good man i mean sounds sounds awesome i'm glad you guys are over there and look forward to to catching up on some of your shows and uh 
and, and nice to to get together and, and meet you. I look forward to meeting all you guys at at ICAST. That'll be great. All is the whole crew coming. I think there's quite a few of the guys start trying to make it down. I know some of the guys on on some of the other kayak brands uh, pro staffs are going to come down with some of those crews. Um, I know as, as part of the, being in the media and podcasting and stuff like that, we, we have an opportunity to go down there at, at, with that also. So if we had to, you know, we could do that, but I, I know there's a few of them that are heading down. I hope to see some of the guys down there myself. Yeah. It's not often we get to, we get to meet up and, and all be together. Um, you know, we did last October, we all went to and fished Dale hollow oh, in yeah. Tennessee, uh, chasing small mouth and, and had a little small tournament and the meetup had a little good time. Uh, so that's fun. And then, um, you know, it, it's just hard to, to get everybody together at the right time, you know, with, with, with families and, right. and vacations and different times, just try to get hard to get it lined out. But I hope we can get together again soon. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. Well, ho- hopefully it'll happen at ICAST. I'm looking forward to everything kind of getting back to normal a little bit. I mean, yes, two, two weekends in a row, we've had full houses, uh, for the UFC. Well, one, one weekend in Florida. The UFC had a had a fight there, and it was a full house. Um, no masks, no no uh, seat between anyone. Full house. That's the first thing that I've seen like that, um, really since since last year. So that was really nice to see. And and you know, in the state of Florida is probably the most open state yet. But you know, I yeah. I, I hope that we're all moving towards getting back to normal and and having you know, in-person events like we were, were doing before, um, before COVID, um, without everybody being freaked out about it or getting sick. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. The cool thing about the kayak tournaments is starting to get back towards all the in-person stuff and the bigger captain's meetings and this and that. But for, for a while there, we were just running virtual meetings like via Facebook live or via YouTube or or something like that. And then, you know, you're submitting everything online. So it's basically you're fishing a tournament and you're just, you know, that's part of it. You're not really getting that interaction. And then, like I said before, that was the whole draw was the camaraderie and and talking to everybody afterwards. Hey, what worked for y'all? And everybody's usually pretty cool about sharing information. And that's what a lot of the grassroots clubs, the the newbies coming in, that's what they all have said is like, man, you know, he talked about, you know, he gave fed us information and gave us talked about what was working. He, you know, you know, there's a lot of secretive stuff in some of these, you know, some, some tournaments at times, but then there's a lot of guys that will, will share everything with you, you know? Right. Well, tournaments are a great way to, um, really speed up your learning. I mean, if you're a, if you're a pretty good angler, that's a way to be a great angler. And if you're a great angler, it's a way to, eat a slice of humble pie and, and realize that there there's a lot more to learn out there because man, I don't care who you are, how good you think you are. You get in those very competitive environments with people from different places and different backgrounds and different, different skill sets. And all of a sudden you're like, Whoa, I thought I knew what I was doing, but turns out (laughs) those guys are really good. And then, you know, you, you figure out what they're doing and then you add that to your skill set. And then now, you know, you, you get a lot better very, 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 very quickly. So I'm, I'm an advocate for tournaments. I think that, uh, that it certainly is, is the fastest way to get better, uh, as an angler or guide, you know, both. But uh, anyway, yes, well, listen, man, it's been great talking to you. I really wish you luck on on uh, the tournaments that you're about to that you're about to do, and and super congratulations on uh, taking your health back into your, your control. That's uh, that's awesome, man. That's really something to be proud of, and you're you're doing wow. awesome with it. Thank you, thank you much. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Um, have to, I, I now got a, I had a new show. I had to go catch up on, I'm yeah. trying to play catch up on all the, the saltwater experience stuff too. And then your podcast is in my rotation now too. So, right on, you know, man. like I said, with that waypoint TV, we got a lot of access to everything, you know, so much, so much information on there. It's just like, man, I got a, I got a lot of, you know, windshield time coming up for <laughs> traveling. I said, man, this is, I done, I found the mother load. <laughs> <laughs> you have, there's a lot, man. We're adding more shows all the time over there, but it's, uh, it's the mother load. So, uh, let me know if you guys want to do something else together. We'll, we'll, we'll make that happen, oh, but man, good luck and let me know how it goes. And, and let's definitely hook up at ICAST. Yes, sir. Sounds good. All Thanks right, a lot. buddy. Thanks. We'll see you, Dustin.